Welcome to the Paul Leslie Hour. We are honored to present the return of singer, songwriter, drummer, and Little Flock music recording artist, Roger Guth. Enjoy. We are rolling. Well, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the very last show of the year. We are joined by a very special guest. He has described himself as a romanticist at heart and lover of lost causes. I'm very pleased to be joined yet again by Roger Guth. He has a new record out. This is his fourth. It's called Three Chords, a Guitar, and a Dream. And that's available on Little Flock Music. You can go to littleflockmusic.com. Also check out rogerguth.com. Roger, how are you, sir? Good. Just came off the river. I was fishing for a bit down here in northern Georgia. North Georgia. Did you catch anything? I did. I caught uh, three trout in about an hour. Hey, not bad. No, <laughs> not for a you know winter day or whatever. Well, it's not really winter, I guess. But so you'll be taking a little time off. You're you're, you're enjoying the. Are you up in the mountains? Yeah, my friend's, uh, Mike Davis's house in Blue Ridge. Do you live nice. in Atlanta, right, Paul? Just outside of Atlanta, yes. Right, right. But I, I've been to Blue Ridge. I love Blue Ridge. Yeah, it's pretty up here. So tell us, how, how do you feel? that this, this is your fourth record, three chords, a guitar, and a, a dream. What, what, what are you thinking now that this fourth record is out? Uh, probably that I'm getting old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. We just, it was just, you know, putting together some tunes that we had written. And then um, Mike was actually coercing me. And he was like, you should put on another album and write some more tunes and we'll sort of complete the album, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, Pete and I did most of the writing last year when when we were kind of, you know, off from Jimmy for a few months there. Well, it's a great collection of songs and I've been enjoying getting a chance to listen to them. How do you get the ideas for your song? Do you get ideas like when you're fishing or how does that happen? Uh, yeah, it just could be any time, you know, it's not usually not when I'm fishing, but um like you get a lyric idea or something and then you're like oh i should you know try to make that work and then you kind of you know fiddle around with it and see if you can come up with something that that you know like like i had that idea for slowly disappearing for a while i was like man that would make a that's a really profound idea. you know it sounded cool but i never you know it took a little while to just sort of like come up with something that seemed to fit the music you know the the lyric with the music you know and i have to say that slowly disappearing song that is a that's a real knockout oh thank you yeah i i think that's a good song i mean it's probably depressing but it's 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 a good song i think well you know i i think it's a pretty profound song has there been a, a biggest revelation you've had over the last few years this has been a, the last few years has been a lot of time for reflection especially for people who are writers is there something that you've learned that's helped you the most well yeah that's kind of where that slowly <laughs> disappearing thing came out i was like wow time is going by you know in fact a lot of the songs are have an underlying thing of like time is going by and there's nothing you can do about it. And so, you know, you better do what you want or, or try to do what you want because the world, you know, time keeps going on. It moves forward no matter what you do, you know? Absolutely. Time waits for no man. <laughs> yeah. I mean, all those cliches apply, you know, and, but, but evolution is a bitch, you know, it's like, it just, you know, it's 24 seven, baby. <laughs> You know, while we're doing something, evolution is doing something else, and it's just, you know, nonstop. And you really feel small, like you're like, wow, like we really are just kind of like little grains of sand, you know, when you, especially if you're looking up at the night sky going, wow. 
like like we're we don't know anything we're like at the canoe stage exploring out you know what i mean like when we're at the stage when people used to carve out canoes that's where we are when we go out in the space you know when we're looking out in the space to me i'm like we have no idea what you know i mean i know scientists and stuff are looking and searching but i mean as far as like being able to to do that it's going to take some some technological breakthrough to to be able to i know this is has nothing to do with song <laughs> that's the shit i think about sometimes well you're right on the button i was hoping we would we would go off course here and there i'm all for it <laughs> <laughs> I like your mustache. Did you always have that mustache? Uh, I think I had it when we uh, when we were seated in that hotel room in Atlanta. I oh, think okay. so. Maybe it wasn't as big, but <laughs> you know it, what you were talking about in terms of of enjoying because time is going to pass. To you know, it's going to pass whether you're having fun or not. It's it's a common theme in a lot of Woody Allen movies. What do you think is the best way to enjoy life? Well, I don't know. I mean, I, you know, everybody's different, I guess, you know, I, you know, do what you love, you know, I mean, it sounds simplistic, but I guess that's, you know, that's part of it. I think, you know, try to, I mean, some people get rewarded from giving back to, you know, helping people or, you know, feeling like they're doing something, you know, other people want to hurt people or, you know, I mean, I, <laughs> everybody's got their own sort of deal, I guess, you know, for me, it's more rewarding to work on artistic things or try to help people or, you know, or go fishing or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. I think the best thing for me is to live life in an artful way. It really doesn't have to be like you're making art or whatever that sort of it's more like living your life so that you feel like your it's your life itself is part of not you know i don't know what's what's the like living well is the best revenge you know i mean <laughs> whatever that means you know i mean for you you know yeah what does that title mean where did you get that from three chords a guitar and a dream <laughs> actually you know i mean it's a common cliche like uh three chords and the truth right that's what they say about country music um but actually i was talking to my son when we were and we were hanging or something and and we were commenting on the amount of like some people showing up to nashville you know and and adam was like yeah three chords a guitar and a dream you know mm. and i was like oh i'm using that <laughs> <laughs> so i steal from everyone all the time you know there's an old writer quote that really good writers don't borrow, they steal. Yeah, yeah. I don't know who said that, but I think it was. I want to show something to uh, the viewers out there. One moment. This is the, the original PM vinyl record. Wow. And, um, you now know. I am depressed. I am old. <laughs> How did you uh, get that signed? I got that signed. I think I was, I got it signed by Pete and Jim. Oh, and, ooh, I should have remembered to bring it when we were meeting in Atlanta, but maybe we'll bump into each other one of these days. And I look at this picture, you guys have been writing together, playing together for such a long time. What do these guys mean to you, Peter and Jim Mayer? Well, they're like my family, you know, it's like, I, I I can't imagine. I mean, it's, you know, I don't even, it's like they're my brothers, you know. I, you know, it's just, uh, it's weird that we haven't like hated each other at the, after 35 years or whatever it is. You know, it's like, I mean, it's different now than it used to be, but, you know, it's in a good way. I mean. mm -hmm. Could you write a song about anything? when we were in that hotel room, Peter was saying you could come up with a title. Like he said, stinky dog. And probably <laughs> there'd be something you'd come up with that would conjure that. Do you think that that's true? Um, well, I don't know if I'm that good, but it's, it, I could probably do it. I've had to do it with Jimmy, like song titles or ideas that 
I would never think of, you know, like, I mean, the one that sticks in my head is math sucks. <laughs> and I'm like, because he came to me and goes, I got this tune idea called math sucks. I want you to finish it. And I'm like, oh, okay. And I was like, I would never write a song called math sucks. It just wasn't, but then, you know, he had more of a comic tilt to it, you know, and that's, it's fun to do to, to sort of challenge yourself. I used to write jingle stuff for a friend of mine, Jay Oliver, and he would like have the jingle. And then these, I would, then these jingle guys would have all this lyrics or that they wanted in these, these songs. So my job was to try to make it cohesive, you know, which was really interesting because, you know, don't, you know, don't just brew the coffee, make it perk, you know, that kind of shit. It's like, who puts that in? I mean, it's hard to do, you know, but it gives you, it gives you some train, you know, it makes you like train you, you know. Well, something that I've noticed when you, when you look through some of the titles of songs that you have written, uh, there's a, a, a song on this record with Cowboy in the title. There's actually two. One of them is a, an, an old Peter Mayer group town uh, tune, but then there's another one. And then you had Cowboy Bal Ballet from years ago. <laughs> so it's a recurring theme of Cowboy keeps showing up in the songs of Roger Guth. <laughs> yeah I'm, i must be big on cowboys i love the the idea of that kind of romanticist like something that's um people have interpreted a certain way and it's really not that way you know it's like like this romantic myth of the american cowboy the reality is that it's nothing like that you know or, or wasn't like that you know it's like it's much less you know but anyway, I like those kind of things. Like, you know, you're always looking for a little, um, what's the word? Like, like artists use, they have like, um, like a little thing in their painting all the time, you know, or something. Yeah, a recurring theme. Right, like a little motif that you kind of like or something, you know. Well, on the note of, of, of like the cowboy myth, I remember in our last interview, you were saying uh, we would talk about a certain song and you would just say, oh, that's another myth I came up with. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the fun of songwriting. Like it doesn't have to be real, right? It's all just your head. It's all just imagination. You know, it's like, that's, you know. Right. It doesn't have to be real or make sense even, you know, it's like, it's not supposed to, well, I mean, you know, it is supposed to be whatever it's supposed to be, I guess. Yeah. Well, like, like Joseph Campbell said, myths are how we make sense of, of this world, how we make sense of being alive. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And he's a, you know, prime example. That's a great writer. H have you been reading any, any books lately? Oh yeah. I, I, I read a lot all the time. Um, I, just, I knew you would ask me that. And I was going to think of something that I just read that I really liked. Um, I can't remember what it was. <laughs> Lately, I've been searching for books to read because I read a lot and I read fast. So I don't, you know, I tend to go through books fast. I mean, one of my favorite writers is Jim Harrison. I don't know if I told you that before, but yeah, and he's, he's gone now, but his books are still great, you know? Oh, yeah. Great. Author. And he's part of that crew with Tom McGuane and Russell Chatham and, you know, the those kind of iconic Western writer. I mean, we, well, Jim was, the reason I really like Jim's because he was the first person from the Midwest who was a, he had a kind of Midwestern ethos to the writing, you know, and, you know, most writers in America tend to be from the East or they tend to gravitate towards Eastern United States kind of thing, you know. That's true. What about movies? Do you have an all-time favorite movie? Well, it would either be Casablanca or Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Oh, wow. Probably that one. Probably Butch Cassidy, just because it's... I mean, those two guys are just so great in that movie. And the movie, it's the screenwriting's amazing. I mean, there's a movie, like, it's constantly... Like, the theme of the thing is that death is chasing them right like and they come and they come back to that who are those guys you know like they're in, and they can't get away from it right mm -hmm. 
and when somebody mentions Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Oh, just some of the lines that 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 um, Paul Newman got to have, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean they're just great, you know. It's like <laughs> I can't think of anything off the top of my head, but. I love the Robert Redford one when he's trying to shoot They're they're trying to hire him as guards and he can't hit anything. And the guy, and he's like, can I move? And the guy goes, what? And he goes like, can I move? And he goes, yeah. And he's like, then he shoots the can like seven times or whatever. It's like, I'm better when I move, you know? Oh, I love the opening scene where he can't, where there's that's black and white and they're, and they're, um, he's like, just ask us to stay. You don't have to mean it, you know? <laughs> and apparently the movie the the company whoever put it out they hated that scene that whole opening thing they said it was too dark and well they i think they didn't like the movie because it was it was very anti-hero kind of you know like it wasn't your typical john wayne western where there's the obvious good guy and then i always think about to me, one of the great soundtrack songs ever, Raindrops. Oh, it, right. That's And that's another reason. It's Burt Bacharach's one of my favorite writers. And all the music in there is like... In fact, I think when that movie came out, that when they did the little montage with hit Raindrops and they're riding the bicycle and stuff, mm -hmm. it was almost like the first music video, you know? It was way before MTV or VH1 and that stuff. Interesting. That's a, that's a great observation. Um, you know, something that I've always felt about you, and the, there are times you've been kind of critical about your voice, but I really, really love the way that you sing. Could you tell us your vocal influences? Um, well, I don't know if I have any because I just sort of sing the way I... I mean, there are people that I think I sound like, like kind of Randy Newman-ish or, or Tom Petty or, you know, like, or Bob Dylan, or I, I really don't sound like any of those people, but I would love to sound like them, but I, it's just kind of earthy and ugly kind of sounding. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just saw, uh, this was on the 2nd of December, I saw Bob Dylan in Washington, D.C., and seeing Dylan in the nation's capital, that was very special. And he's got one of those voices. It's like a lot of people would say, well, that's really a strange voice or it's a different voice. But to me, it just comes from such an authentic place. And that's why I like it so much. Yeah, I, I'm not a huge Dylan guy, but when I listen to the classic like the famous record, I can't think of which which one it is, but the early ones, it's it's really cool. You know, my son was a huge Dylan guy. And, um, you know, it sounds really cool. I mean, I've heard him lately. It's kind of like, yeah, I don't know if you should be singing, dude. Because you can't, you can't even understand it, you know, but but he's old now, you know. So, but, but when he was, when it, you know, when it was the shit, it was, like those great, like Lady De Lay or whatever, you know, that it just sounds great on that stuff. Oh, yeah. Lay, Lady Lay. Roger, if you could do a duet with anybody, if you could snap your fingers, anybody alive, who would you do a duet with? Hmm. You mean just for fun or like serious? <laughs> either... Either on a fun, uh, as a fun thing, you're, you're having a few drinks or in a, on, in a recording studio or on stage. Well, it'd be fun to do one with Shania Twain, but that's just because I would like to look at her. <laughs> it, anybody else? Well, I don't know. I, I can't imagine doing a duet with anybody. I could see you doing a duet with Randy Newman. Yeah, yeah, that would be, I mean, I would love to do that, but I, you know, uh, the, I, I mean, I just don't consider myself a singer, so I don't know, you know. Hmm. Well, you know, you, you get to go to a lot of interesting places. At this moment, you're in the North Georgia mountains. Uh, what place have you been to 
whether you're on tour or you're just traveling, that really, really sticks out in your mind as a, a great place? Oh, well, well, I like France a lot. France is just gorgeous, you know. I love Paris. Um, the English countryside is really pretty too, like Hampshire and and um, and I like Colorado a lot and Montana, New Zealand, New York. I love. Um, yeah. So you know. I mean, I'm sorry. It's it's all kind of river oriented, yeah, <laughs> except yeah. for the famous cities. <laughs> well, you know, you know, I I know you have some French blood in you. What are those French shows that you've done throughout the years with Buffett and company? What are those like when you go over there to Paris, France, and perform? Well, they're fun. It's a cool. We play at this really well. We played a bunch of places, but the past few times we played at this. I can't remember the name of the theater, but it's a real famous um, theater over there. And it holds like 3,000 people or whatever, you know. And it's, um, it's just, it's just, you know, I think most of the audience is Americans, actually, because, you know, I, Jimmy thinks they're all French people, but they're not. <laughs> they're just expats who, who live there, or they're just people that a lot of people just come over there to go to Paris and go to the Buffett show, you know. Well, by the time people see this or they listen to this, I, I should I should note that Jimmy Buffett will be turning 75. He'll be 75 by the time this airs. Wow. Yeah, 75 years old. Do you see him ever retiring? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. I mean, I, I you know... It's going to be interesting how it plays out, you know, because he's not a guy that likes to stay home. You know, he likes being Jimmy Buffett and he likes performing and he likes traveling. You know, he's never home. I mean, even when he's not on the road, he doesn't stay home. He doesn't stay in one place that long. He's always doing something. I could kind of imagine, imagine him being like a Willie Nelson, who's 87, or a Bob Dylan, who's 80, and just tour perpetually forever. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think, you know, I mean, I've, I've talked to him a little bit about it, and he's like, man, I don't know, you know, and then, and I've talked to Mac a little bit about it, and, and Mac's take is that Jimmy looks at Paul McCartney real, like, he and Paul are kind of buddies, so they talk, and, you know, I don't think he will stop until, unless he has to, like he gets, you know, he gets ill or life happens or whatever, but I don't, that's the only way either that or nobody comes to the show anymore. Which I don't see that happening either. So, I mean, he will definitely want to go out like on the top, you know, like, but I don't think he, I think he could probably sell out until he doesn't sell it. I mean, until he says I'm done, you know, or whatever. Right. You know, just a little while ago, you were mentioning the the album Beach House on the Moon that had that Math Sucks song on it. And this is maybe a, a, an obscure song, but I always felt this was a really underrated gem. You wrote this with Peter Mayer, and I could imagine you singing it and recording it, but I just think it's an underrated song. Can you tell us about the inspiration behind Lucky Star? Lucky Star. Oh. Wow. Am I on that? You wrote it with Peter, <laughs> but, but I can imagine you singing it. I don't even, I, I'm sorry, Paul. I don't even think I, I mean, I'm searching my memory for the, I mean, I know that the title, but I can't for the life of me think of how the song goes. It's like, I got a roof over my bed. Someone to love me in a four poster bed. Oh yeah. Huh. Yeah, I don't know where we, I don't know where we, I don't, I don't know if that was a Jimmy idea or, or if we came up with that. I, I really, I'm sorry, I can't remember which, there's so many songs, I mean, that I, somebody told me the other day that I have the most co-writes with Jimmy, or I used to, and then Mac took over again, so. <laughs> 
you have shared the stage and you've recorded with some interesting people, especially through the whole Buffett thing. But, you know, there's been Toby Keith, uh, James Taylor, Mark Knopfler. Has there been anyone who really knocked you out that you got to share a stage with or record with? Um, well, Paul was pretty cool. I had to admit it, that was, I mean, he, he's, you know, whether you're a Beatles fan or not, you can't deny that those guys, they're actually really good. You know, no. like when they open their mouths, it's like, wow, that's really good. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. And he's such a nice guy, you know, it's like he, he comes up and introduces himself to you and you, and he kind of looks at you and goes, yeah, I know I'm Paul, but let's get over that. You know, I'm just Paul. Like, don't think of me as Paul McCartney. Like he seems very un unegotistical about it, the whole thing, you know. Is there anybody that you would like to work with that you haven't yet? Well, probably Pat, but I don't think he's going to call me. Pat Matheny. Pat Matheny? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I've always loved Pat, and I grew up being a jazz drummer, so that's, you know, if I could pick somebody that I wanted to play with, and, and th th I would do that. Well, Roger, I can promise you this. I will email Pat this interview, and we'll see <laughs> what happens. You just never know. <laughs> I sent him a postcard one time and much to my surprise, he emailed me and oh. I, was, I thought it was someone pranking me, <laughs> but no, it was him. Well, he actually knows Pete and Jim a little bit. You know, there was a, a long time ago, he, he was a, he, he had come and seen Jim playing with a jazz trio and he really liked Jim's upright playing, but um, you know, that was 30 years ago, but I'm just, so he does know those guys. He, I mean, he probably knows my name, but mm -hmm. you just never know. No, you never know. <laughs> if, if I get hired from Pat Metheny from you, I'm going to, you know, kiss you on the lips. <laughs> That's a first anyone said that to me, but <laughs> <laughs> well, since we're in the jazz world, there's something that I've, I've always wondered about. Now, is this true? He was a, a, a guest on this show, which always floored me. It was really difficult for me to interview, but isn't it true that you played one time with the late, great Mos Allison? Yeah, yeah, a few times. With, what was that Jim, like? I think Jim played with, with me. Yeah, it was, it was interesting. He's not easy to play with. I think I still have a crick in my neck from, because you... Yeah, I mean, the way the band was set up, I was over here and Jim was next to him and he was over there. And you kind of just had to watch him the whole time because he didn't, he would just sort of, it, he doesn't play live like he does on the records. Like it's all like kind of, like he told, he, he, he said to me, he said, I don't want to hear the hi-hat on two and four. And, and then he was telling Jim, like, don't play any thirds or, or in the bass or anything, you know. It, it was much more like... Um, you know, for lack of a better word, it was kind of Ornette Coleman-ish, you know, except he would sing and, and the harmony would still be there, but he was very like, you know, specific. So you just kind of sat there and looked at him, you know, and tried to follow along. <laughs> it wasn't fun. It, well, I, I, not to disparage Moe's because he he's great at what he did, but it wasn't fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's one yeah. of those learning situations where you're young and it's like, oh, I got to be able to do this, you know. What about playing with the the late jazz guitarist Herb Ellis? Do you do, did you play with him? Yeah, I did a couple of gigs with him too. Same kind of thing, you know. But he was, you know, you didn't have to watch his hands all night. But but um, you know, sometimes those old jazz guys they have the, they're like very set in their, their what they want and what they don't want, and they also come with like a kind of attitude about the whole thing, you know. So hmm. it's, it's, it can be challenging, you know, it's like, you really got to, you're sort of paying your dues. One of the things that I like to ask people who tour, touring can mean that the highlight of a certain place is a restaurant. You know, there, there can be, 
you're in this certain city and so you got to stop in at this certain place is there a restaurant could be anywhere in america that is at the top of the roger guth list yeah there's one in san francisco called parabaco i believe is how you pronounce it and it's just the most incredible italian food and i've been there a few times and they in fact, I talked to the owner a few times just because I couldn't believe how good it was. And it's it, it's a kind of an upscale place, but it's it's great, absolutely great. If I would recommend anybody going there, and I don't think they went out of business or anything. And but it, it's very hard to have a restaurant like that 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 keeps the that never changes, you know, like keeps the consistency. Oh yeah. Are you you're an Italian food lover? Yeah, that's probably the, my favorite. And then I like French food and, and Asian food a lot and most everything. But, but that restaurant sticks out in my head. You know. What about in Nashville? Is there a favorite place to eat in Nashville? Well, I like, there's a real simple place called Mar Cafe Margot, which um, Margot is the, sh she's been there. She was like the first, like, kind of person doing the real like you know farm to table cooking I don't even want to call it that because it's such a stupid name but um anyway she has a little French place and it literally is like going to a little French bistro it's a, it's in an old gas station she's never bothered to update it you know the bar is funky it's uncomfortable but it's really great food you know and there's some other now Nashville's overrun with you know famous chefs and good restaurants but I still like her place the best because it's it's a little un like she doesn't try to chase a trend you know you just go there and get coco vin or you know beef bourguignon or you know sautéed trout or whatever it's it's just like going to a, a little french bistro no pretentiousness you know they don't act like they're reinventing the wheel you know it's it's but it's all really good like they have you know all the vegetables come they try to get them from a farm that they have that raises their stuff for them and stuff and you know it's just very like like it's real well it's supposed to be to me you know pretension is really the ultimate sin isn't it yeah <laughs> well it can be fun but it's just like after you leave you go wow why did i do that you know well for anybody who is uh has checked out this uh this new record of yours uh, or anybody who is is planning on it. it's called three chords a guitar and a dream is there anything that you want people to get out of the experience of listening to this album well hopefully they'll like it you know um, yeah i like the three chords tune a lot and i like I think all the tunes are good and some of them i like more than others but i think they all turned out really good and it's kind of the whole album's pretty up except for the the last tune like so the slowly disappearing tune so but i i i feel really good about it and also i must add that pete did all the production and he just did a phenomenal job you know like he's just you know he's 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 really become way good at that whole production process i'm not sure is that sound coming through this 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 little guy's he's been sawing oh, logs. <laughs> oh, what a cute dog. <laughs> That's the neighbor's dog. Oh, I thought I thought at first I didn't even he was he's so blended into the sofa, <laughs> I didn't even now I see it's like your arm was over it. That's a cute dog. He's so good. Oh, I love dogs. Yeah? Oh yeah. We we got a dog last year because my wife was wanting one. We had a dog that was my son's, but she died. And anyway, I was resistant for years, like, oh, I don't want a dog. And, you know, now we have this dog, Boo Boo, who's like a hound dog. And oh, my God, she's, she's the best dog. <laughs> so sweet. Dogs are the best. They are. I mean, <laughs> the, the, the dogs are really great. <laughs> yeah. They're one of the great things in life. Really, all you need is a dog and a garden. That's really all you need. The rest of it's all, you know, horseshit. <laughs> You, someone's going to quote you on that, Roger. Yeah, maybe that should be a song. I've got a dog <laughs> in a garden. Well, 
before we go, uh, I just want to remind everybody they can get this at littleflockmusic.com and also check out rogerguth.com, G-U-T-H. Any parting words for our viewers or listeners out there? Oh, I can't think of any, but thanks for having me, Paul. It's a great pleasure. I've enjoyed this a lot. Yeah, that's just really great. Thanks for doing this. Thank you. All right. All right, sir. Well, have a good time. Yeah, I'll talk to you soon, Paul. Thank you. All right. Till next time. You know, the Paul Leslie Hour is made possible by people like you, listeners, viewers. Please go to thepaulleslie.com slash support, and you'll know what to do when you're there. Thank you. Thank you, everyone who contributes. Video editing today by Kumar. Performance of The Entertainer intro song by John Primerano. And of course, this is your announcer speaking. See you next time on the Paul Leslie Hour.